Hi, this is Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly Q&A show. If you've got any questions about mountain bikes and tech, get them into our email address at the bottom of the screen right there, or you can get involved in the comments below this very video. Don't forget to use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech so we can easily find which ones are questions and which ones are responses, and uh, we'll hopefully get you on next week's show. Right, kicking it off this week, the first one is from Amistry20. I noticed that one of the pistons on my hydraulic disc brakes wasn't moving much, but the opposite piston was moving smoothly. I assumed I needed to internally lubricate the pistons. After putting everything back, I pulled the lever and it felt super, super spongy. Have I damaged the piston seals or let air into the system? There was no residue of oil leaking anywhere on the system. Um, do you know, I don't think we've made a video on, on actually doing this, but I have got something quite handy that um, I got from SRAM recently, so this is quite good to actually show you. So it's a cutaway brake caliper here. Now on the inside, this is for anyone that doesn't know this, you've got your brake pads here, and then these are the pistons, and these are the channels that the oil pushes the pistons along. Now holding the pistons in place are these rubber O-rings right here and here. Now they are what allows the piston to slide through, and also what pulls them back into place again. So they're quite important bits to make sure that are lubricated correctly. Now, if you found that your pistons aren't moving correctly, most of the time it could be cured quite easily. And the way to do that would be to take your pads out of the brake, set them aside, maybe on some shop towels so they can't get any moisture on them. Then very carefully pull your brake lever until the pistons start pushing in. Now be very careful, you don't want them to completely touch because at that point they'll nearly be out of the caliper itself and in which case they're susceptible to getting air underneath them, even if oil doesn't leak out. So this could be something that's happened to yours. And it really wouldn't take much, the tiniest bit of air, look how small the channels are on the inside here. You've only got to work out the teeniest bit of air in there will actually really affect the performance of your brake. Now, if you have any sort of sticky pistons at home, the way to cure this really is to get those pushed out and basically you need to lubricate or at least very much clean the surface of the piston there. Now a good thing to clean that with if you've got mineral oil brakes would be mineral oil or brake cleaner, anything like that, and make sure they're nice and clean because ultimately those pistons retract and if they bring in any dirt back inside there, it's gonna affect their performance in the long term. Now it's not essential that they both move exactly the same amount. You can never really get that perfect unless you do a full caliper strip down and a rebuild, which I guess we could we could do that, I suppose, just to show you the exact insides, in which case you need a specific type of grease when reassembling those. So we'll get into that in a video at some point. But if this is happening to you, do what I say there, just let those calipers push the pistons out slightly, clean them, and then push them back into place. Now you'll find you have to push them quite firmly. A tie lever is good for this because it won't damage the actual surface of the pistons. And also, it does mean you can put a decent amount of force on them because they do have to push back past the O-rings and the O-rings have to almost realign themselves. So it's quite an important thing to do. Um, it does sound though that air just has got around yours somehow. So um, in which case, the only real way around that is a proper bleed. Um, learning to bleed your brakes is quite an easy thing to do as long as you understand the rough principles, just like bleeding a radiator, pretty much opening one end, pushing fluid through and allowing those air bubbles to migrate. Uh, of course, there's a few little tricks to, to help air that gets tucked in little areas. Um, we've got a few videos on those. I'm gonna put a link to bleeding some SRAM brakes in the description below this one. And from that video, you'll be able to click through to a Shimano one as well. Now we did tackle this on a previous Ask GMBN Tech, but we're still getting a lot of questions in relation to head angles and fork offset. So this one's from Marcus Knittel. Um, help please. Does this change the head angle? If I switch from a 51 mil offset fork to a 44, I know it changes the trail, but I don't want it to change the head angle. This is what I want to avoid. Um, in a word, no, you can't really change the head angle. The head angle is simply the axis that is going down through the fork to the axle, straight through that steerer tube. Now the offset just changes certain handling aspects of that and what it actually means with your trail on the ground there with the contact patch. You can't change the head angle, but changing your offset can have some similar effects to changing the head angle. Although, in an ideal world, you just want a bike with the correct head angle in the first place. Craig Ryder wants to know, should you grease gear cable inners when replacing them? I never have done, but my local bike shop says I should. 
Uh, to be honest, there's mixed opinions on this. Some say you should use a fine grease, some say you should use a, a bit of oil, essentially. What I found the best actually is avoiding the grease because I found even a thin grease can increase that friction slightly, especially if you're running a full length outer cable. Now, of course, you definitely want some sort of grease or oil in your cable outers because of the fact that you can get corrosion and you can get water in there, which of course all leads to bad performance in the long term. Now, your bike shop's right, you can use grease, that's fine, but personally, I would always opt for the thinner option, which is oil. Now, I've used all sorts of different oils over the years. Some include a wet chain oil, literally a couple of drops of that work really, really well. Um, as you push the inner cable into the outer sheath there, you kind of get a bit of lubrication on it as it passes by, so that works nicely. Or for your convenience, you can use a spray lube because you can really just flush it straight through. Just make sure you keep an eye on where it comes out the other end because quite often it's going to be near your disc rotors and your braking surfaces. Uh, so it's a good idea if you're doing that to either get a rag over the end or get someone to hold a rag over the end for you uh, just to make sure it can't do that. But yeah, I would go with a very thin oil. Oh, this is a good one. Right, so this is from Pyro Ultimate. I just watched a great video by Tom Stanton about an anti-lock braking system on a push bike. It was clear that th this did not have an application in normal biking, but I was wondering if it could be useful to avoid crashes in a downhill race situation, or maybe in the new UCI e-bike category. Uh, he, even his attempt was very good, and he was confident that it could be much better with a larger budget and better electrical engineers, something the likes of Shimano or Shan would probably have. Um, yeah, I would agree. Um, ABS braking could be very, very useful for certain aspects of cycling. Now, I do remember a brand, um, I forget how you pronounce it, an Italian brand called uh, Brovadani. Uh, they did make some brakes way back in the 90s, uh, but you have to bear in mind that back then the brakes weren't that good to start with, so making them anti-lock brakes was, I don't know, not really that effective. But they were a rim brake, it was cantilever design, and they had a roller in front of the brake pad, and the roller was slightly cammed. So essentially when you went to pull the brakes on hard, what would happen is the brake pad would vibrate very slightly, it would never actually go completely on and off. That roller would keep it sort of resonating almost, um, oscillating against that rim. Um, the idea being that you could pull them on as hard as you could and it would never lock. So you'd get really good braking um, in theory. But uh, in practice, like I say, cantilever brakes were not the ultimate thing in the off-road market. Uh, I could definitely see some advantages for our skinny wheeled road bike friends because all you've got to do is lock up a front wheel on a road bike and you're basically using your face as a brake. So uh, you definitely want to minimize the chances of that happening. And if that system would work, then I think that is something they could benefit on. However, now they're now taking advantages from us guys using disc brakes. So they've got a whole new realm of problems to deal with there because the brakes actually work now. Um, but um, I did have a little look because I do remember someone at Eurobike telling me about stuff and I remembered it was Magura. So Magura have been working with Bosch basically making ABS brakes for e-bikes. Now look at this video here. This is super cool. So all right, so the guy and the video is clearly riding sort of an urban commuter bike, but you get the point. So it deals with the fact that you can't accidentally lock up a wheel, especially a front wheel, which would send you over the bars or brake traction. Basically it senses, there's lots of sensors on the bike, I guess it's got accelerometers and things that figure out what is going on with the rider's body weight and how aggressively you're braking. And it does the same thing at the brake pad that enables them to sort of fluctuate so fast, faster than your human hand could actually do. And in theory, and at least what it shows here is him not going over the bars and not riding into cars. And it even simulates it in an off-road environment where you're breaking loose on loose terrain there. So I definitely think there is something that can be done. And I've just sent that video, in fact, over to the EMBM boys because I think that there could be something quite interesting there for us to do as a bit of an experiment, maybe a trail side experiment. So I think, why not? I think ABS could be really beneficial. Um, perhaps not for downhill racers who want ultimate control and they need to grab major handfuls of brake. Um, but at the same time, perhaps if it was that good, it would be really beneficial. Maybe they could brake harder without the risk of losing traction. Um, interested to know if anyone else has ridden any sort of ABS brakes or perhaps you remember those Italian brakes from the 90s. I'd love to hear from anyone that has experience of ABS brakes on a mountain bike. Uh, let us know in those comments below. Cheers, guys. Okay, this one's from Curtis Flat Reality. 
Hi Dolly, cool show dude. Uh, no, thank you, <laughs> didn't mean to read it out. Um, the reason why I like to run rim brakes is because they're easier to maintain. I find they work just as well because of the costs. Are there any reasons I should consider moving to disc brakes, i.e. muddy, snowy trails, etc.? I only have basic bike tools like Allen keys, adjustable spanner, pliers and a hammer. Rather get info from you than my mates, lol. <laughs> okay, well firstly, thanks for the props there. I'm glad we can help you out a bit with decisions you make. Um, from my point of view, for off-road bikes, disc brakes are a complete no-brainer for several reasons, but it doesn't mean you need to have really expensive hydraulic brakes, and I'll get to that in a minute. So the first obvious reason to me is your wheel, your rim, that's part of the structure. When you're braking on that, you're wearing away that structure. That alone, for me, on mountain bikes is one of the reasons I do not like rim-based brakes. It also means your braking is very inconsistent. It changes in all situations. Granted, if your brakes were to work as well as disc brakes, your grip comes into it as well. But um, you will find, and I'm sure you know this, if you're running in wet conditions, it will take a bit of time before your brakes really start kicking in. You don't have the same feeling braking in the wet as you do in the dry. Uh, now, you can set the brakes up to be better, but they're not ideal. And like I say, you're wearing away the rim surface. And then obviously the brake pads themselves, if you're running in wet, gritty conditions, because of the rubber compound they're made from, they do wear out quite fast. And of course, that is fairly expensive in the long term. Granted, disc brake pads are expensive too, but you can pick suitable pads for your conditions. It won't really hamper your braking too much. Now, the other, the other thing to bring into it is the fact that you have better mud clearance. There's no brakes clogging up a big part of the bike there. In the old days, when everyone used to have cantilever brakes on their bikes, you went riding in the UK in the mud, you'd end up with huge balls of mud all congregated around that part of the bike. You'd literally have to reach in and scoop the stuff out in order for your brakes to even work or even vaguely work. Um, so you don't have those issues. And then, of course, you do get buckled wheels from time to time. When the rim's moving from side to side, your brakes will not work properly on that rim. If you've got disc brakes, which are at the center of the wheel, they carry on working exactly the same. So there's just a few reasons why I really like them. But the benefits to disc brakes, as well as those obvious things, are the fact that when you've got your disc brakes set up properly, they're bled if they're hydraulic brakes, and they've been bedded in correctly, they work phenomenally in all conditions. They just, they are far superior in every way. There's absolutely no reason to not use them. Now, if budget is a problem for you, um, you could continue using your existing brake levers and you can get some cable operated disc brakes. You'll get all of the benefits of disc brakes. Granted, you will still have to change the cables here and there. Uh, they don't feel quite as nice as hydraulic brakes. And ultimately, they might not be quite as powerful, but you definitely do have a lot of the same advantages. The only downside is in order to use them, you do need a bike that has disc brake tabs on the frame, and you'll also need wheels with hubs that are compatible, and of course, a suspension fork or a fork with tabs on there. If you have those, then it's well worth looking into some cable disc brakes, or go the whole hog and save up for some hydraulic ones if you want the ultimate performance. Okay, and last up this week is from the imaginatively named Son of Supernova. Hey GMBN, thanks for being so helpful all the time. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, on rim tape, you suggested using Gorilla Tape. However, I had a WTB KOM i29 that was taped this way and had a nightmare fitting a Maxxis High Roller 2 double down to it. Uh, steel tie levers were involved. <laughs> um, when I removed this tie, I found the Gorilla Tape had moved to obstruct the bead. Ah, uh, yeah, that'll do it. Um, and it had spread adhesive all over the place. Yeah, that's a pain. Um, after hours of miserable scrubbing, I cleaned all of that stuff off, used electrical tape as rim tape, and a tire fitted like a dream. Um, am I riding into a problem in the future, or will I live happily ever after? Uh, still with tire levers retired and never to be seen again. Much love. Um, to be honest, it does sound unlucky. Now, I've, I've personally used Gorilla Tape on many wheels for a long time, and I do recommend it to my friends to use, but that said, if it's the wrong combination of width with your inner rim width, then perhaps it is putting tape in places where it's not so good. Of course, some rims have a bit more of a channel for it to sit into, other rims don't. And perhaps your rims don't, so maybe that's why it's caused a bit of a problem. And of course, the thickness of it would mean that it can make the tire a very tight fit. And that tire in particular, the double down casing, is nearly a downhill tire. Uh, it's quite thick on the sidewalls there. So yeah, that will definitely cause you some issues. Um, that said, brands like MV often supply Gorilla Tape as their, seal, as their tire sealing tape with their rims. So it does work, but it just sounds like you've been unlucky or it's got the, quite the wrong combination there. 
Now, electrical tape, yeah, I've used this before, um, more in a case of when I've had nothing else laying around, it will definitely seal off the rim nicely, which is ultimately what you want. But electrical tape, because there's not much adhesive on it, um, after a while it can break down and it can come unraveled or the ceiling can get underneath it on the inside, it will work happily for quite some time, but that's just what you might find happens. Um, so just keep an eye on that and basically good luck with it, but I think you'll probably be all right for a while. There we go, there's another weekly Ask GMBN Tech show in the bag. If you've got any questions, let us know that email address. It's hellotech at gmbn.com right there. Or you can ask them in the comments below the video. Um, if they're questions, naturally use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. And for a couple more useful videos, click down here, go straight through to our essentials playlist. That's the no frills. This is how you fix your bike stuff with all the little tips and tricks, some of which even more experienced mechanics might want to learn from. And click down here for Thomas Slavic's bike check from the Valparaiso Urban Downhill Race that Blake and Neil went to recently. As always, if you love GMBN Tech, give us a huge thumbs up. And of course, don't forget to click, share, and like our stuff. Cheers, guys.